What's up, everybody? Darius Daniels here, lead pastor of Change Church in the great state of New Jersey. Listen, if you're ever in the New Jersey, the New York, the Philadelphia area, please come by and see us, worship with us. We've got two campuses in West Hampton, that's Southern Jersey, and in Ewing, that's Central Jersey around the Princeton area. Hey, you can look us up online, lifechange.org, and it'll let you know when our service times are taking place, the series that we're in. We'd love to meet you and love to show you some Southern hospitality. I know we're in the Northeast, but I was born and raised in Mississippi, and we'd love to meet you and to worship with you. You know, speaking of New Jersey, Mississippi, from time to time, I have the privilege of traveling domestically and abroad, sharing God's word. And um, I had this opportunity to be in Auckland, New Zealand again. I know I showed you one from last week at one church, but I seemed to be a regular there. And this time I was at a church called Life Church with this incredible leader named Paul Dejean. And uh, I spoke at Life Conference. And I did a message called, A Mind for More. Listen to me, are you listening? God leads you from one level to the next, head first. If you can get your mind out, your life has to follow. This message was really a part of a series that I taught at our church, Change Church. I took four weeks and I taught a series called, I Changed My Mind. And I talked about mind management and mind renewal. And I want to take you into Life Conference. And I want you to hear a part of this message called A Mind for More. I'll be back in just a few minutes. Enjoy, be blessed by this broadcast. But Paul speaks here about the importance of transformation. And we have to partner with the Holy Spirit in renewing our mind with this. And this, this, is, not, this is not works. This is an expression of faith. D Dallas Willard puts it this way. He says, grace is opposed to earning, not effort. Grace means that we don't earn, but grace doesn't mean that we don't put forth an effort. As a matter of fact, putting forth the effort is an expression of faith. Are you hearing me? Yeah, it's not grace. It's not, I mean, it's not works. It's faith. Putting forth the effort is an indication that I believe God is getting ready to do something. Come on. Putting forth the effort is a revelation that I am confident that if I do my part, God's going to do his. Come on. Putting forth the effort is an indication that I believe that if I draw close to God, God's going to draw close to me. Listen to this. Listen to this. So then, if we want to experience mind renewal, we must co-labor and partner with the Holy Spirit in doing so. And this means there is some prep work that we must engage in so that the Holy Spirit can do his works. We must position our mind to be renewed. Only the Holy Spirit can renew or renovate, rebuild my mind. But I must position my mind to be renewed. How do I do that? I do that by three things. Number one, it means I must decide to have an open mind. I must decide to have an open mind. God can't teach us anything if we already know everything. I'm going to say that again. Yeah, God can't teach us anything if we think we already know everything. You can't walk through open doors with closed minds. Your mind has to open before the door does. And if God is stretching your mind, come on, maybe it's an indication he's getting ready to open a door. I'm going to say that again, too. <laughs> I said, if God is stretching your mind, maybe it's an indication that he's getting ready to open a door because your mind has to open before a door does. This means we must be open to allow God to renovate, renew, to renovate our mind. And renovation sometimes is messy, right? Renovation is actually more messy than construction because there are things you have to knock down. Walls that exist that must be torn down. Remodeling. God wants to remodel our mind, and we must be open to the remodeling because even Jesus refuses to help people that won't open their minds to his help. In John 5, he asked the man who had been at the pool, but that's the 38 years. Do you want to be made well? 
we, we, must be an op- we must have an open mind. In John 9, we see an amazing example of this. In verse, uh, Jesus is in, engaging in performing a miracle for a man who can't see. And in John 9, 6, it says, After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, and told him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. The, the, this word means sent. So the man went, washed, and came home seeing. So this is what happens. He can't see. Jesus spits in dirt, makes dirt mud, put mud on the guy's eyes, and then tells the guy, now I want you to go home so you can wash. Uh, it's, it's so much in that. I got so many questions about that. I won't. <laughs> uh, but this is the thing. The man would have missed the miracle. He would, he would have kept closed eyes if he didn't have an open mind. See, there are some things in our life that stay closed because your mind's not open. See, if he would have been closed-minded, he would have said, okay, wait a minute. What are you doing with that dirt you're spitting in? What? Time out. What's that? Does that make sense? But he allowed Jesus to literally spit in dirt, make mud, and put mud on his eyes. His eyes got open because his mind did. All right. We need an open mind. Number two, we need an honest mind. We can't get to where we're going if we aren't honest about where we are. I can't get to where I'm going if I'm not honest about where I am. The truth sets us free. And if truth sets us free, then deception keeps us bound. I have to have an honest man, honest mind. Faith does not deny reality. Faith changes it. Faith does not deny the existence of giants in the promised land. Faith believes my God is bigger. Faith does not deny the reality that a door is closed, but faith believes that God's got the key to unlock every door. And when he gets ready to open a door for me, it doesn't matter who's on the other side attempting to hold it shut. God will open doors that no man can shut and close doors that no one can open. Come on, family. Honest mind. Can't get helped if we're honest. Number three, we must have a hopeful mind. A hopeful mind. Jurgen Moltmann says this. He says, the sin of unbelief is manifested in hopelessness. The sin of unbelief is manifest in hopelessness. And he says this. He says, hopelessness is the premature anticipation of the non-fulfillment of the promises of God. Hopelessness prematurely anticipates that God will not fulfill his promises. The key word there is premature. Because wherever there is hopelessness, it means that somebody has stopped believing too soon. Because God is a finisher. And if it isn't finished, God isn't done. Because whenever God gets done, it's going to be finished. So if it's not done yet, we should not despair. We should not have a pity party. We can actually have a praise party. Because God is a finisher. And when he gets finished, it will be absolutely done. It will be undeniably done. It'll be unequivocally done. It'll be irrevocably done. When God gets done, it's just done. It's done with a period. It's done with an exclamation point. It's not done with a comma. It's not done with a semicolon. When God gets done, it's done. And if he isn't finished, it isn't done. Hopelessness sets in when we believe God's done. The premature anticipation of the non-fulfillment of the promises of God. But a hopeful mind is a mind that's full of hope. Belief, faith produces hope. Hope is the expectation that God's going to perform what faith believes is true. And that hope becomes the anchor that holds us steady until God finishes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. And so once our minds meet this criteria, we have positioned our mind for mind renewal. The question that also begs to be asked and answered is this. What does mind renewal look like? It looks like the mind of Christ. So when God is renovating and rebuilding and reconstructing our minds, the blueprint that he is using is the mind of Christ. He is building According to those plans, it will be the mind of Christ. What does that look like practically, Pastor Darius? It looks like a mind that is governed by the Spirit of Christ. 
Mind renewal is about governance. It is a mind that is governed by the Spirit of God. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. He says this, the mind governed by the flesh is death. Do you see that? But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Do you see that? Uh, nobody in the balcony said anything to me. Do you see that in the balcony? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so watch what he says. He says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Like one translation says this. It says, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It's really scary because he didn't say to be spiritually gifted is life and peace. He says to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because we can be spiritually gifted and not be spiritually minded. And spiritual gifts are used to bless others. What happens with your mind determines whether or not you're able to bless you. Right? See... Your gifts do it for others. Your mind does it for you. And your gifts can help other people experience a degree and a dimension of peace that you miss yourself because you can't gift yourself into peace. You have to think your way into it. And so whether or not I have pity or peace is determined by what's governing my mind. And Paul says if God's spirit is governing my mind, then I have life and peace. But if the flesh is governing it, it is death and it is destruction. Am I making sense? Yeah. And so a mind that is governed by the flesh or governed by the soul is a mind that is actually governed by impulses, appetites, and emotions. I'm going to say it again. A mind that is governed by the flesh is a mind that is governed by impulses, appetites, and emotions. It's, it's governed by feelings. And we're supposed to live with feelings but not be governed by feelings. God intends for our feelings to be indicators, not dictators. Feelings are great servants, but they're horrible masters. Feelings should be in the car, but they can't drive. Yeah. Because if we allow feelings to drive, we'll crash. Am I making sense? So we are to live with them but not be led by them. And Jonah's story is a powerful picture of what happens with a mind that is unsurrendered. Well, I'm about to show you that Jonah, as a prophet, surrendered his gifts, but he didn't surrender his mind. Because when we read Jonah's narrative, we, 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 we're introduced to it in Jonah 1, right? And Jonah receives prophetic instructions. He's not a novice prophet. He's not mentioned frequently in Scripture, but he is mentioned one other time. And he is not a novice. He is not a newbie at this. He is a prophet that God trusts to deliver a message to Assyria. Right? God tells him to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. He said, I want you to deliver this message. The text is very clear. Jonah gets that instruction. And the Bible says that God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah goes in the opposite direction to a place called Tarshish. So he goes uh, down from where he was to Joppa. He pays a fare, gets on a ship, heading toward Tarshish. So he has to go down to Joppa, then pay a fare, to get on a ship that's going in the opposite direction. Because whenever you're in tension with your assignment, you're always going to go down. And number two, it's always going to cost you. Jonah wasn't running from God, per se. He wasn't defecting from the faith. Jonah didn't embrace an aspect of his assignment. Come on. Yeah. Jonah, Jonah did not like his marching orders. Jonah said, when I said yes to the call, I didn't know this one was included in the yes. 
So he gets on this ship, goes in the opposite direction, and the text says, first of all, this strong wind comes. It's so strong, it threatens to break up the ship. Now, you would think at that moment, Jonah would see, maybe I didn't make the right choice. <laughs> you would think, you would, th you, you would think, but see, but when your mind is unsurrendered, your discernment is impaired. And so there are things you should see, you don't see. There are things you, you shouldn't ignore, we shouldn't ignore, that we do ignore. So his discernment is impaired. And so this is what happens. The men on the ship start throwing cargo overboard to try to lighten the load on the ship. Now, these were merchants, so they needed this cargo because they're transporting it from one place to another. They're throwing it overboard. So this cargo is actually their valuables. So this is what they're doing. It's important because this applies to our homes, it applies to our businesses, it, applies to, it definitely applies to our ministries and our ministry teams. Because when we have people who have unsurrendered minds on our boat, you have to throw your values over to keep them on. If their mind is unsurrendered, at some point in the journey, you may have to choose between them and your values. So they're throwing their values over. They threw the values, threw the values overboard. And this is what's scary. While they are doing this, read Jonah 1 when you get a chance. Jonah is in the bottom of the ship, sleep. <laughs> I'm upset about that. He's, he's, in the, he's in the bottom of the ship, sleep. He should be up top at least helping them. But when someone has an unsurrendered mind, they will create conundrums that they are unwilling to help you fix. They make messes and leave you with the responsibility to clean them up. So this is what the men do. They try to roll Jonah back to shore. They're unable to do so. Because the Bible says God had prepared, I think it's Jonah 1.17, God had prepared a big fish. See, when God does not allow you to get somewhere one way, it's because he has prepared another. <laughs> See, sometimes it's not that God isn't going to get you there. It's just he's not going to get you there that way. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes, sometimes we feel like God's not allowing me to get there when sometimes God has arranged another mode of a transportation. So this is what happens, right? Jonah says, this is really weird. He tells the man, throw me overboard. Now I'm thinking, you grown. You can just jump overboard, right? <laughs> but when someone has an unsurrendered mind, they place an expectation on you to do things that they should be responsible for themselves. And so, as Dr. Henry Cloud says, they expect you, who's being responsible, to be responsible for their irresponsibility. So they're irresponsible and happy, but you're responsible and miserable because we're being responsible for their irresponsibility. Does that make sense? So they actually throw, they throw him overboard, and the Bible says, that he is swallowed up by the fish. One translation calls it a whale. Now, I used to think that that whale was judgment until I did some studying on whales. And then I came to my personal conviction, at least, that that whale was not judgment, that whale was grace. Number one, whales do have teeth. And they have very potent stomach acid. But when you read chapter 2, you'll see chapter 2 reveals Jonah's in the belly of that well for three days and three nights. But he is composed. He is whole. He is not torn to shreds. He's not consumed by the acid. Because sometimes we can be complaining about the well we're in, not realizing the miracle is you're whole in it. Is there anybody here that's grateful that God has kept you whole 
in some wells. Is there anybody here that's thankful that even though you're in something you'd rather not be in, God is keeping you together, he's keeping you composed, he's keeping you faithful? It's so amazing. Jonah has this moment in chapter 2. God speaks to the whale at the end of chapter 2, and the whale spits Jonah out. And then to me, to me, this is, to me it's the most profound verse in Jonah's entire narrative. It's Jonah 3.1, and it says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and said the same thing that he said to him yeah. in Jonah 1. So after all of that, <laughs> You went through all of that, and now you still have to go to Nineveh. <laughs> right? Because when God has something for you to do, you've got to realize one of his strengths is patience. He will wait you out. He will allow you to run, but he'll let you see you can run, but you can't hide. Because when my hand is on your life, you will come. You can come now, or you can come later, but you're coming. You can come kicking, or you can come screaming, but you're coming. When I've got something for you to do, I will not rest until you do. This is often where Jonah's story stops, right? We preach, he goes and he preaches to Nineveh. We preach these amazing results. But that's not where the story ends. The story doesn't end in chapter 3. The story ends in chapter 4. See, Jonah goes through all of this in the first three chapters because he has surrendered gifts, but not a surrendered mind. His mind was governed by his feelings. And you get to see this in chapter 4 because the story really doesn't end on a positive note. The story ends in chapter 4. We read it. When Jonah sees God sparing Nineveh, verse 1 in chapter 4 says, but, Jonah, but to Jonah, this seemed wrong. Listen to this. I want you to see how illogical the mind is when it is governed by feelings. He has just received grace. He is a lie because grace rescued him. Yet he becomes upset, he's unnerved, he's disturbed, he's perturbed when he watches the same grace that he just benefited from be given to people that he just ministered to. Do you see this? And he says, he, he prays to the Lord and he says, this is why I didn't want to do this. This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you were abounding in love. I knew you were a God who relents from sending calamity. Now take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Listen to this. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Listen, everybody, I hope you were blessed and encouraged and inspired by that message. I can't tell you how much this teaching revolutionized my own life. I remember when I took my annual sabbatical, I take uh, a few weeks every year, several weeks actually, to, for rest and for replenishment and for refueling. And I studied my entire sabbatical what the scriptures had to teach about the mind. And from that time of study was birthed this series called I Changed My Mind. Now, if this message from New Zealand bless you, without a doubt, I want to encourage you to get the entire series called I Changed My Mind. I took our church, Change Church, right here in New Jersey, through four weeks of teaching on the mind and what the Bible has to say about it, what it means to actually renew it. How can I manage it so my, so my thoughts are in the car, but they're not in the driver's seat. They're on the passenger side. How do I discipline my thought life so I'm not always consumed by worry? How can I change my mind? Because where the mind goes, the life follows. I'm telling you, it changed my life. I believe it'll change yours. I want to get this to you right away. Right here on the screen, you see our website. There's also a number that you can call so that we can rush this series to you. We want 
you to experience mind transformation. I'm telling you, when you get your head out, your life follows. We want to get this to you right away. So I want to encourage you to resource yourself, to invest in your sanity. Invest in your spiritual vitality and development. And we want to encourage you to get this series. We want to get it to you right away. We believe it will revolutionize and absolutely transform your entire life. You know, we're able to bring this message to you because of faithful, dedicated partners. Jesus had partners in ministry. Paul had partners in ministry. And I believe it is the order of God to collectively bring people together to collaborate because the power of all of us is greater than the power of any one of us. And when you partner with this ministry, you are helping us take this life-changing gospel all around the world. I want you to go to DarisDaniels.com and I want to encourage you to become a partner of this ministry. As you are able and as you are led, your partnership means the world to us. And we have made a commitment. It is a personal commitment. It is a commitment of our ministry that we will resource those that resource this ministry. That you will not support us and help us take this gospel all around the world and you not be blessed by the very gospel that you are helping us spread. So we have this commitment to resource our partners, to make sure they have the latest resources that are released, whether they're study guides or books or booklets, that you have exclusive teaching that is set aside, that is created specifically for those that are partnering with this ministry, and that you are always encouraged as best we can with God's word. We take good care of our partners, and we want you to consider being one. We know that together, we can continue to change lives, and God can use us to change the world. Thank you so much. Remember, I love you, I'm praying for you, and I'm believing for God's best in your life. Continue to let God change your life. He's gonna use your life to change the world. I'll see you next time. Take care. Join us same time next week for another insightful and practical teaching from Dr. Darius Daniels. For additional information and resources, visit us online at DariusDaniels.com. And when you visit, please consider partnering with our ministry as our mission is to take this life-changing message to all nations. Our desire is to reach and positively impact the masses with this life-giving Word of God. However, we can only do this with your dedicated support. So we thank you in advance. And feel free to connect daily with Dr. Daniels' expanding social media family and become a part of an incredible and lightning move of God. So thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week for another awe-inspiring word from Dr. Darius Daniels.